Hello, good afternoon to everybody. Hello, this is Ilaria Conti from Florence School of Regulation. Thank you so much for joining us for this uh, online debate on the role of LNG in the energy transition. Um, we have today with us uh, four uh, speakers uh, representing, I'm very happy because uh, we managed to cover the wide spectrum of uh, the uh, energy stakeholders, gas stakeholders, and experts on, uh, on this topic, and I will uh, right away uh, introduce them to you. We have uh, Christopher Jones, uh, now part-time professor with us here at the Florence School of Regulation, but uh, uh, having a really uh, long experience uh, at the European Commission. Uh, Christopher has worked uh, many years in DG Energy. I think, Christopher, you joined the Commission in something like the 80s, 1985, if, I, if I'm correct. Um, then uh, we have Peter Fraser uh, of the International Energy Agency, where he heads Gas, Coal and Power Markets Division. We have Jacques Rottenberg, uh, working for the uh, LNG platform operator uh, LNG in France, but uh, today representing GLE, which is a group of GIE, the Gas Infrastructure Europe. And uh, Bernard Van Hol, uh, EU Affairs Manager at IOGP, which is the International Association of Oil and Gas Producers. Welcome, everybody. Thank you very much for accepting our invitation and for, uh, for being with us today. Thanks. Good afternoon to all. So, <clears throat> um, why this topic? Um, well, uh, there were a few years ago, uh, there was a, a time when uh, LNG was uh, populating uh, the debate much more intensively than today. But uh, this statement can also be understood as restricted to Europe. Uh, we are used uh, these days to hear more and more uh, the Brussels uh, debate uh, centering around uh, renewable gas, hydrogen, uh, in the effort to, um, namely to reach the decarbonization targets that Europe has uh, given itself. Um, but uh, on the other hand, uh, Although, uh, of course, these uh, decarbonization targets are very important to reach, and uh, it's now a clear decarbonization path, what uh, Europe has chosen uh, for the energy sector, uh, we probably, uh, it's probably too early to uh, completely forget about the uh, traditional ways of uh, uh, sourcing energy into the European uh, sector. Um, so there's not only renewable gas, there are still, uh, and are probably due to stay with us for at least a few years more, also the uh, conventional sources of, um, of gas uh, storage. And today we are going to discuss about LNG. So. Um, is it really over for LNG uh, in Europe? Uh, what's the status uh, in, uh, in the rest of the world? And um, how are the perspectives for, uh, for LNG? Um, how can it be used? Is it useful uh, as an instrument, as a tool, in, also in uh, the energy transition uh, for Europe? We are going to discuss about uh, these topics with our speakers, and um, I'm, I'm just, uh, um, I would just like to remind to all participants that, um, well, many of you, as we can see, are already familiar with our tool, with our online debate tool, and thank you very much for uh, using the, the chat box below the screen. You are invited to um, write your questions anytime. Uh, while we speak, and uh, I will collect, uh, possibly try to group some questions uh, and um, deliver them to the to the panelists uh, for their comments. So do not be shy, and uh, feel free to uh, to ask uh, questions for the panelists in the in the chat in the chat box. But first, I would like to. Uh, exchange some uh, data, some views uh, that I collected, um, just to 
show a bit the trend that uh, that we see in Europe. So uh, at the moment, um, or let's say in the course of this year, in 2018, uh, the European demand got back to uh, 2009 levels. Uh, so after uh, a decrease in uh, until basically last year, we are now back to uh, 2009 levels for demand of gas, of gas of course. Uh, the expected demand uh, is uh, assesses around four, plus 45 additional uh, BCMs of gas to be imported in Europe until 2023. And we are aware that uh, in uh, in the Netherlands there has been a, there was a bill proposed in March 2018 uh, providing for the the phase out uh, of uh, of Groningen. Uh, therefore, uh, the production is set to zero to, uh, by 2030. So. Um, Based on these considerations and also on other data that you uh, may be aware and of course are very welcome to bring to the discussion, um, I would like to ask to, uh, to, to the panelists what, um, what uh, they think uh, are the perspectives uh, for, for the role of LNG in Europe, considering that, as I said, uh, demand is expected to grow. Uh, while at the same time uh, product, uh, production in Europe uh, is, uh, is due to, uh, to decrease also because of Groningen. Um, let's uh, first uh, ask this poll to, uh, uh, to the participants and then I will ask the panelists to, to comment. So Chiara, uh, I'm curious to uh, uh, know from you, all participants, where you see a role for LNG in Europe as a support to the carbonization of the energy sector. So, Will uh, the perspectives uh, be the best uh, in the application for the maritime transport or in road transport, uh, urban mobility, so let's say uh, LNG-fueled cars, um, road transport, so heavy-duty vehicles, heating? Uh, do you see LNG mainly as a supply, additional supply to the electrification, which is anyway planned for Europe, as a mean of security for security of supply? Flexibility, storage, others. I deliberately uh, chose many <laughs> possibilities, but you also have the the chance to select more than one option if you want. So let's allow some more time. There is almost an exequo. There is an exequo at the moment. <laughs> okay. Okay, good. So the poll is now closed, and we see that uh, security of supply seems to be uh, the most obvious, um, um, let's say, use for uh, for LNG. Uh, then maritime transport as well. Uh, there has been a lot of uh, reading in the news, I must say, in these days about uh, application of LNG to maritime transport. Flexibility also and storage. So. Um, not much for uh, urban mobility. And this, I'm sure it's not good news for some <laughs> operators in the sector. But OK. Um, let's uh, start uh, commenting on these uh, polls. Uh, I would like to start with Christopher, perhaps, if he has any views and additional comments. Can you hear us, Christopher? Yes, perfect. We can. OK, we're back. Thank you. Um, so in order to look where we're going to be with LNG, I'd like to start with the, some fundamentals of demand and supply, because that gets you to an answer of where we're going to be. Um, and look at where we're going to be in 2030, 2040, 2050 in terms of European gas demand, and who will supply it. Um, over this weekend, I wrote an article uh, which is entitled Have Compassion to a General Counsel, trying to give any prediction to his board regarding corporate strategy for utility 2030, let alone 2050. And I think that is characterized by what I'm going to say here. And I'm very much looking forward to hear what Peter's going to say um, about this. So according to the EU, where we are today, 
EU demand is expected to fall from about 470 BCM today, that sort of number, to about 340 in 2030, be more or less flat until 2040, and until towards 2050 it's expected to reduce. In the 2050 paper that the Commission published earlier this week, um, sorry, last week, um, it took a much more aggressive approach insofar as we are focused on a 1.5 degree global warming scenario. But let, let's move with this 340 BCM a year by 2030, <clears throat> and then stable by 2040, and think about that. Now, let's first of all think about um, domestic indigenous production, because that's going to fall off a cliff, more or less during the same period. So that the need for European imports, according to European Commission figures, are going to be more or less stable to 2030 and 2014, perhaps even increased towards 2040. Um, so let's let's take that as a first point, that we expect imports to at least maintain where they are today, 2030 and 2040. Okay. Now, these figures are predicated on the Commission meeting all of its targets um, to 2030, and we have every reason to hope and desire and expect that they will, but they're not that simple to do. Um, according to Thierry Bross um, of the Oxford Energy Institute, um, European energy intensity has reversed since 2014, so that we're now using more energy the use of the uh, GDP, and the total amount of energy we're consuming is increasing, which is a change in what, where we've been since 2008. Now, you take that, you take that combined with the fact that the energy efficiency targets, which are also predicated on the idea that um, many of our buildings are going to be refurbished a lot faster rate than they have been until now, which is really, really difficult to do, means that the 340 BCM per year is probably a baseline in the absence of additional very, very <coughs> difficult measures to take. Now, so where are these imports going to come from? Wait, wait, wait. Norway, Christopher, yes. so, thank, thanks a lot. Sorry, I have to uh, very, be very strict with time. And uh, I have to, I'm afraid I have to cut you here, but because you also sort of anticipated my next question. So it's a very good moment to cut you. Sorry, Christopher. <laughs> Um, then I would, uh, going back to the results, uh, Chiara, if, sorry, if you can g go back to, yes, perfect. Um, I would be interested also in, uh, in having uh, Peter's comments on, uh, on these uh, results. So, Peter, you are very well placed at IA to uh, have clear view on, uh, on where we are going to head with LNG in Europe. Um, Sorry, uh, perhaps you have your mic unmuted. Yes. Yes. Try now. Okay, are you hearing me now? Thank you. That's that's better. Okay, well, well, thank you and uh, thank you and good afternoon, everybody, except our uh, our uh, participant from Brazil, where I guess it's good morning. <laughs> um, and uh, and th and thank you, Christopher, for the for, for the lead in on on. These points, I think, I, I, first of all, I, I quite agree with Christopher that the, it's not a matter of demand going up, really. Um, the interesting findings, both in our gas market report, which we issued a few months ago, and our World Energy Outlook that we issued a few weeks ago. When we look at Europe, we see demand being fairly flat and then declining over time, uh, thanks to, thanks to uh, efficiency measures uh, on the demand side. We don't see a big increase on the uh, on the power gen side, which we might have anticipated, especially with the with the plan removal of coal plants and in some cases nuclear plants from the mix. Uh, we do think I would completely agree with the survey question that security of supply, both um, LNG, will have a role on the security of supply side, both uh, on the gas side itself in terms of diversification of sources but also in the power sector where it may not be a lot of gas in terms of volume or BCMs, but having that gas available uh, when you need it, when demand spikes in the winter time is going to be really important. Uh, 
recent example of this this past March, the so-called beast from the east in the UK. Uh, UK last year, 2017, only allowed 7% of its power gen came from coal. But during that period of very cold weather, they were using 20, the coal supply 28% of the electric energy that was needed. In a few years' time, that coal's not going to be there. And so security of supply is going to be really important. In terms of other developments that may, uh, that may at least support the current level of demand in Europe, uh, I do think there will, there will be some, some contributions from, from heavy duty uh, road transport. Uh, maritime transport is something more of a meet, uh, longer term thing, even though despite the, uh, the looming deadline for the, uh, for the uh, maritime organization emissions limits. But we think there's some real potential there. But I think on the, on the heating side, it's actually going to be uh, uh, losses, not just from on the gas side, not just from greater efficiency, which is probably the most economical approach, but also in terms of increasing electrification. I think you're going to see a stronger policy push on that side in Europe, and that's going to, that's going to impact the demand for gas. Great. I think I'll, I think I'll leave it there. Thank you. Thank you very much, Peter. And um, Jacques, uh, what's your view? Yes, uh, thank, thank you. Uh, first of all, uh, if you allow, I would like just uh, to recall that uh, GLE is in, is an association that represents uh, uh, 15 European energy terminal operators and that uh, covers about 90% of the existing LNG import capacity in Europe. Uh, in, in order to give so, some, some figures, there are presently more than 30 LNG terminals in Europe with a global capacity of uh, 210 BCM per year. Um, th this uh, an order of magnitude, this figure uh, represents about 45% of the European gas consumption. In last year, in 2017, uh, less than one quarter of this capacity has been used. So that's, it means that there are a lot of capacity that is available, uh, and that is everywhere in Europe. From the point of view operator, of an operator, this figure is uh, not uh, very satisfying, but. Uh, this is nevertheless a good, uh, a good news, I think, for the energy transition. As uh, LNG, and we, I, I think we will see it uh, during the discussion, LNG is, uh, from our point of view, uh, the best friend of renewables. Um, indeed, the high level of uh, flexibility of energy supplies, together with the low emissions of the natural gas, make LNG an, ad, an ideal partner for the development and of the integration of intermittent renewables uh, energy such as, uh, such as solar and wind. Regarding the role of LNG, I think it will play in the coming years, uh, uh, it, it will play a role in, in, in every sector. This is what we, we see on your um, on your, on, on your screen uh, with differences, of course. But I think that the, the LNG will play a role in every sector, in the traditional ones um, and also in the new sectors. I, I would like just to recall that um, as a natural gas, because LNG is liquefied natural gas, LNG is the cleanest of all fossil fuels. It emits no sulfur oxides. It allows a very large reduction of nitrogen oxides, of particulate matters, and uh, uh, it contributes also uh, to a reduction of CO2 emission. For, for instance, for power generation, it emits half of the amount of green gases uh, compared to, to coal. And uh, regarding, still as an example, regarding the new uses, LNG offers an excellent opportunity for improving the environment footprint of the transport sector, should it be the marine, the shipping sector, 
the maritime sector or for heavy duty vehicles. And, um, and, and maybe a, a last word with respect to security of supply, which is an important uh, uh, topic according to, to the audience, and, and I agree for that. I, I would like to, to underline that LNG is reliable and flexible. And this is something that uh, has, a, has a lot of value with respect to volume um, as well as uh, with respect to peak demand. Okay, excellent. Thank you very much, Jacques. And so, um, Bernard, uh, what's your view? Do you agree with the, with the polls and uh, with the, the other panelists so far? Thank you, Elia, and uh, good afternoon to um, everybody. So, uh, Bernard Vanel for IOGP, and just allow me to, to remind uh, what IOGP stands for. Uh, it stands for International Association of Oil and Gas uh, Producers. So, our members produce oil and gas uh, worldwide, but if we focus on the, the EU picture, um, IOGP members produce 90% uh, of uh, European uh, gas production. So, to provide an answer to, to, to your question, I would like uh, very briefly to have an helicopter vision about uh, the energy demand in Europe, what it is uh, today and what it will be uh, tomorrow, and then maybe to, to answer the poll and to focus on maritime uh, transport. So the helicopter vision about energy demand um, in Europe, we have the various energy mix, so you have uh, uh, energy coming from, from wind, from hydro, nuclear, coal, gas, oil. Um, today, oil and gas is a little bit uh, is good for a little bit less than uh, 57%. By 2040, in a 1.7 degree scenario, oil and gas will still be good for uh, 40%. And actually, gas, the demand for gas in 2040, in a Paris Agreement uh, compliance scenario, gas will represent the, the biggest share of the, the energy demand in, in Europe. That's the general picture about gas. Now, when you translate that into potential demand and for, for LNG more specifically, um, I will take the example of maritime transport where there is a, a very interesting potential. Uh, first, it's uh, important to, to remember that maritime traffic is international by, by nature. Just think about the traffic between China and, and Europe. That's one. Two, think that where the big ports are located, Rotterdam, Antwerp in the north, but also Gibraltar as a main uh, bunker hub. And if you take that into consideration, and also the context of um, the international context and the EU context about emissions regulation, there is the, the SOX uh, limitation, but there are also the other limitations about NOx, and probably in the future about uh, small particles. And the recent one uh, from, from you know about um, CO2 or greenhouse gases, there will be there will be significant demand for um, alternative fuel, and because of the pressure on the shipping industry and uh, the very uh, tough market conditions they're operating, the, the the margin of profits are very small. We believe we do believe that ship owners, when they will have to make a choice for an alternative fuel, they will choice for fuel which can offer a lot of environmental benefits. And uh, Jacques from uh, GIE explained the benefit in terms of SOX, NOx, and, and others. But they will also choose for fuel which is available on the market and at a decent price. And today, such alternative fuel which is available in large quantity and at a decent price, it's LNG. So LNG already today is there to provide some answer to the significant pressure which is on cheap owners to reduce the emissions. So all this together, um, high regulation for uh, decreasing um, emissions from vessels, main ports in Europe, uh, Europe being located on a main shipping lines, uh, these all elements offer good prospects for LNG. Excellent. <clears throat> okay, thank you. Thank you, Bernard. Thank you all. So we uh, can be reassured. Uh, we all see a clear role, uh, even more than one, for LNG in Europe. 
Uh, let's now, uh, let's say the most difficult part was, is probably done, so we can now turn to, uh, well, let's say enlarge the perspective and um, look at uh, uh, some data from uh, overall, from, for, uh, let's say from LNG in, uh, in global terms. And here I listed just some data that I thought would be significant, um, just uh, highlighting that uh, there are uh, big perspectives, great perspectives of development for LNG if we look worldwide, uh, expected to pass this 500 BCM by 2023. Um, and uh, there are uh, Asian markets that are developing at a quite uh, fast, uh, fast pace, uh, particularly China, as we know, and the United States uh, that are increasing their uh, gas production and uh, are now um, uh, assessing their LNG exports uh, uh, around 75% uh, of growth. Well, it, these are estimations, of course. So. Um, Let's say different numbers uh, compared to, to Europe, different uh, perspectives. Um, let's uh, ask the panelists uh, what, what their view is on, uh, on this data, again, and on others that you're welcome to, uh, to add. Uh, considering that uh, while in Europe, uh, as I said, gas production is expected to decrease, we, there is this big growth uh, if we just uh, uh, turn our eyes out, uh, out of Europe. And uh, which do you think are the most important uh, trends that will be able to, uh, to shape, to, to, to trigger um, developments in, uh, in the LNG sector? Um, I, this time maybe I would start from Peter, please. Thanks for the opportunity to comment on this one. This is certainly a topic that we've looked at in both our gas market report and in our World Energy Outlook. Uh, we do expect uh, global gas demand to increase and really that increase is being driven by Asian demand, particularly Eastern Asian demand and number one of that is China. Uh, this year's growth uh, in Chinese, Chinese demand overall and in LNG demand, which is really driven by a policy rather than by the economics of it, uh, is, is really one of the driving forces behind fairly strong, very strong uh, LNG growth for the next few years. China's increase alone in LNG imports will be about 30, 30, 30 to 35% of the total global increase that we expect to see. Other countries, uh, other countries in Asia as well are also increasing uh, their imports. And that's thanks to a couple of technological developments. Uh, it's much easier now to get into the LNG importing, importing activity than it used to be thanks to floating storage and regasification units. And also even production is getting a, a, a little quicker to develop now equally with, uh, with floating, uh, floating LNG units that have, have been developed recently. So we see some trends already that uh, gas, the, the, that the LNG market is becoming a little more open and uh, and attracting more investment. After a bit of a pause in LNG liquefaction investment uh, in the last year or two, we've now seen a, a significant investment out of Canada, uh, L, the LNG Canada project that Shell is leading up, and we think there'll be more developments on the supply side as well. And the main target really for these investors is Asia. Uh, the, of course, I neglected to mention the other one that is already growing on the supply side, which is U.S. production. And they're actually the one that's going to become uh, the, one of the big three of LNG producers by the early 2020s, which is the U.S. growth. Uh, we expect that, along with, along with Qatar and Australia, to be kind of a big three of LNG production and all competing uh, to satisfy a, a growing demand, but in fact, it looks like the production will will outstep the supply at least for a year or two. So we may have a bit of a surplus. So I think it's a very interesting time in the in the global LNG markets, uh, and uh, but I also see real prospects in in beyond the next few years for further further investment. 
the couple of provisos is that we don't know um, we don't know in some cases how price sensitive some of this new demand is. Uh, we do expect prices to develop to, uh, to rise ro to drop a bit first, but then start rising again. And the cost that you need that uh, developers need to build new LNG facilities is there a big enough market to to keep it growing? We think there is, but of course there's some uncertainty. Uh, so that makes more gas available. Now, when we look at European, how much of that gas is going to be available to Europe? It's obviously the Americans who are who are very interested in selling more LNG to Europe. And once those facilities are up and running, certainly that creates creates a, a, a resource there. But the other interesting resources are in Africa and in Qatar. Qatar has indicated it wants to expand its its development. And unlike the U.S., where the gas is being bought on the market, even though U.S. prices are fairly low, Qatar, in effect, gets its gas really, really cheaply. And uh, it can pull gas up at a very low cost. And as a result, it is quite competitive at supplying Europe. There are also some eastern, uh, uh, sorry, interesting developments in both eastern Africa, Mozambique in particular, where we think there's going to be really significant growth, and also some in West Africa as well. I'll leave it there. Very good. You leave us always with, at a very interesting point. Uh, you leave us with many potential questions. But um, let's uh, ask then Bernard uh, to comment on uh, this uh, this data and also uh, the interesting additional points brought by by Peter, if you like. Okay, thank you, uh, Ilaria. Maybe um, as a producer, I, w I will focus on more on the, the first part of, uh, of the question, uh, at least in the way it is um, drafted. Um, yes, indeed, uh, about the European production, um, people have in mind uh, Groningen and then uh, the decrease of production also uh, in the UK, which is a major basin. Um, it is true. Completely true. Now we, we need to keep in mind also uh, the recent uh, discoveries in Norway. Norway is part of, of Europe, maybe not the EU, but uh, but Europe, EEA, and uh, a lot of uh, the EU regulation has <coughs> been a main supplier to, um, to, to European gas for EU gas demand. And then what is probably also um, Probably uh, underestimated is the potential in the East Med uh, with uh, shippers who has made uh, very uh, interesting uh, discoveries recently. So uh, there is still potential in Europe. Uh, don't believe too quickly that uh, the activity is, is over. Uh, and actually, there are even reserves which are not uh, tapped, potential reserve for an additional 25 years production of gas in, in Europe. Having said uh, so, um, European production uh, is not enough to meet the, the, the EU or the European uh, demand, so there will be uh, still in the future for sure a uh, need for importation and uh, LNG offers uh, major flexibility. Peter has mentioned uh, uh, two major trends, uh, Asia, uh, the Asian uh, demand for, for LNG in the future, and also in terms of production, uh, U.S. increasing the, the production for, for gas. So uh, these will be the two key elements of, of the future dynamic and where this LNG cargo is, is, is going to, will go to at the end of, of the day, um, I guess it's, it's, it's more, it's much in the, the hands of the market. The market deci will decide where the cargo will go to. Okay, <coughs> thank you, Bernard. And uh, uh, Jacques, uh, what do you think about the global perspective? Yes, yes, this is, um, this is a, ver a very difficult question. Uh, making provisions uh, over the future is always a, a difficult exercise. During the, the last two or three years, uh, uh, many analyze, analyzed, uh, analysts, sorry, uh, regularly predicted uh, uh, a wave of LNG in, in Europe, and um, uh, even this year, during the first uh, nine months, uh, that means uh, from from January to uh, to to September, uh, 
the standout, the global standout from LNG terminals in the EU was lower by 15 percent, 15, 1, 5 percent, compared to the same period of last year. And suddenly, suddenly uh, in October, uh, the, the panorama has totally changed. For the first time since uh, 2011, so the first time since uh, the Fukushima uh, event, accident, uh, the global standout from the European terminal uh, in Europe uh, exceeded the level we have seen in so in 2011. So it's uh, it's difficult to to to, to predict the future. Uh, what is sure is that uh, November will be also a very uh, uh, a month where uh, uh, the standout from LNG terminals will be very high, also maybe even higher than uh, than in October. But having said that, uh, there are uh, uh, there are some tendencies, as uh, my colleagues have already mentioned. So there should be a need for uh, an increase. Of, of the import in uh, of, of the import of uh, of gas and uh, due, due to the reduction of the production in uh, the domestic production and uh, part of it uh, should be LNG. Uh, sure. LNG is in competition uh, with uh, with pipeline gas, uh, in particular with uh, Russian gas. We have not mentioned. Uh, this point and, until now, but this is a, this is one of the ma major major points. Sure. Uh, uh, United States are pushing to send LNG to Europe, and uh, uh, we see Russia uh, that is also interesting to sell its gas and even its LNG uh, in 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 Europe. Uh, an important part uh, uh, of the of the production from Yamal has. Uh, Remain in, in, in Europe, uh, and uh, based based on on the on the figure, on the preliminary figure of, of this year, we have received Europe has received twice more uh, LNG from Yamal than from United States. So there is a competition, and it's uh, it's a question of price. It's a question also of politics, and, and on this matter, yeah. it's very difficult to uh, to make uh, previsions. Indeed, uh, Jacques. And uh, thank you very much for, uh, you already actually answered one of the questions which had arrived. Uh, meanwhile, uh, one of the participants asked if, spe if uh, speakers saw LNG competing with pipeline guns in Europe and uh, I, I suppose for, it, for all of, uh, of you, um, you agreed with the Jacques that uh, the, the answer is yes. And as uh, Jacques correctly said, uh, prices are very different in this uh, competition and uh, politics uh, play a very big role. So yes, um, thank you very much. Uh, I would then ask Christopher to um, uh, conclude uh, with uh, some thoughts on, uh, on this second question uh, about the global perspectives for LNG. <laughs> Christopher, you also uh, we worked together, we organized uh, with Florence School and the Commission last year, very nice, very interesting European-Japan Jap uh, summit on, uh, on LNG, so, which also brought us a very different perspective. Yeah, you're right, it was, it was a summit and then four workshops. Um, and you might remember in the first workshop just a little more than a year and a half ago, everybody was talking about um, the LNG glut um, and that it was going to be a buyer's market until mid-2020, whatever. And then all of a sudden, China puts in a 25% increase in LNG consumption in the year. And then all of a sudden, we're talking about it's going to be a tight market already in the middle of the next decade. And that reflected what Peter said, that um, we expect prices to drop and then rise again as um, the demand supply balance gets tighter and Asian demand um, increases. So I think as Peter all, also um, uh, intimated to, um, follow the money. Um, the question of how much LNG you're going to get in, into Europe will either depend on is it competitive pipeline supplies, and if it's not, will governments do things in order to ensure that it enters the market anyway for security of supply reasons? Um, 
once we have Nord Stream 2 and Turk Stream 2, Russia will have enough um, capacity, <coughs> even actually excluding um, the Ukraine, to provide a very significant part of the market. Um, if you add the Ukraine, it can supply the whole of the market, and there's lots of reasons to believe that Russia has understood that Gazprom has understood that one of its essential priorities is to monetize the gas while there is still a big market for it, particularly in Europe. So there the question is, um, what will be the role of LNG in the light of a supply maximizing major company with huge spare capacity in the context of a tight LNG market with high prices? And probably that answers itself. Indeed. Okay, um, great. Thank you very much for these uh, remarks. Okay. Uh, Can I just, just ask Peter what he thinks about oh, this sorry. question? Sorry, I, I missed that. Sorry, Peter. So, Christopher, exactly what's, um, what's the point you want me to answer? Do you also see um, the likelihood that Gazprom will seek to monetize its gas reserves and protect its market share and try and increase its market share at the cost of LNG? Because that would be the logical thing to do. Well, as, as you pointed out, it certainly will have the capacity to do so. Uh, I think, I, I, I think uh, when, we, when we do our outlooks, we tend to assume that LNG does play an increasing role, but uh, that uh, both, you know, the need for greater imports is, ends up being split between pipe gas and LNG roughly 50-50. So that's how we come down on it. So presumably that's, well, well that's, that's, that's how we see it right okay. now. Okay, thank you very much. I think it's now time to uh, dedicate uh, some attention to the questions that we have uh, meanwhile received in the box. Um, Let's start, let's go to in a chronological order. Uh, how do the speakers estimate the impact of methane leakage on uh, the utilization of uh, LNG? Well, methane leakage is, again, one of the um, topics which was discussed uh, also at the latest Madrid Forum. Um, uh, the European Commission uh, took a, a quite clear position uh, um, in uh, um, uh, deciding to, to go more in depth in, the, in this topic, uh, to, to make an assessment of uh, uh, the numbers of uh, methane leakage. There's an ongoing study on this topic. So um, what's uh, the impact on the utilization of uh, LNG, in fact? Uh, who would like to answer this question, Peter, or? Well, I'll, st I'll start with that by mentioning some work that we've done about uh, for last year's World Energy Outlook. Uh, the 2017 World Energy Outlook had natural gas as a special focus. We certainly looked at the methane leakage question in, in some depth, and I think a couple of observations. The first question, the sort of question that people raise is the question of, well, is it, there's so much leakage from from natural gas production and transportation that you're better off sticking with coal. So we had, we had a look at this question and we concluded based on the kind of leakage rates that, that, are, that are being observed that, that that's generally not the case. Uh, second thing though is that we, we, when we had a close, closer look at the, uh, at the emissions patterns uh, based on the data that we were able to find, uh, that we that there are actually are lots of economic opportunities to to uh, to eliminate these uh, eliminate these leakages at relatively low cost. So in fact, we assume about over half of the leakage that takes place could be could be eliminated cost effectively. And we have some uh, analysis to that effect. And we are, it's good to note that some of the the major oil and gas companies have t has, have taken up on that and have identified a, a leakage reduction as a as a priority for them, making those economic investments uh, to reduce methane leakage. Okay. Good. Thanks. Um, does anybody else would um, want to comment or add anything? Yes. Maybe yeah. I, I can okay. add for something for uh, oil and gas uh, producers. Okay. Bernard uh, first. Yeah, uh, indeed, uh, methane leakage um, is, is an issue um, that uh, is not to be underestimated. At the same time, in the 
Um, uh, could you keep your mic a little bit closer? I think the audio is a bit intermittent. Yes. Yes. Okay. So I was saying uh, it's an important issue uh, that should not be underestimated, and at the same time, it needs to be put into its proportion. And uh, Peter Fraser from um, the International Energy Agency uh, made that uh, very well. Um, it's uh, it's an issue that is taken with uh, a lot of uh, seriousness by uh, oil and gas producers, and uh, we are putting this um, issue high on our agenda uh, in the, the full supply chain <coughs> production and transport uh, to monitor and to see how we can reduce these um, leakages. Now, if we uh, jump to the specific segment of uh, shipping, so LNG is marine fuel, there is also um, concern about uh, methane seepage, it's not leakage, but seepage for whatever reason. What I would like to say with that regard, um, it depends, it exists, and uh, the proportion depends on what kind of engine you are using, what kind of technology you are using. Um, and there is today, in terms, I'm not speaking about NOx and SOx reduction, but about uh, greenhouse gas reduction from uh, shipping bunker fuel. There is today, there is no silver bullet solution. So uh, even with seepage, uh, um, we still believe, we strongly believe that uh, LNG can be can be uh, an element of the solution. But of course, you need to uh, implement best practices to make sure that you reduce the seepage to its uh, minimum minimal. Sure. Okay. And Jacques. Uh you want to complete the answer, please? Yes, uh, I, I, want, I would like to, uh, to add on what has been said, that um, the methane emission, of course, is uh, something that uh, the industry has to, has to look very carefully at. And uh, that's what uh, the, the midstream has done. I mean, uh, GIE, uh, GIE members have participated uh, to a survey, uh, to a study made by Marco Gas uh, regarding the, uh, uh, the emissions, the, the methane emissions from transport, uh, underground storages, in, and uh, LNG terminals in, in Europe. And uh, the result and the figure are, are, are public. And uh, so the, the result is that uh, the methane emissions from um, from the transport sector, uh, from the underground storages and energy terminals are very marginal compared to the uh, gas consumption. Uh, so one, one figure, uh, the methane emission is less than half uh, a thousandth of the, of, the gas, uh, of the gas emissions, of the gas uh, consumption, sorry. So it's a, it's a very, very, very small figure. The most important thing that has to be done, I think, is regarding production. Regarding LNG, maybe one one precision also, uh, uh, because the LNG is transported by ship. Uh, we have to to have in mind that uh, the uh, boil off from from the uh, from the tank in the ships are reutilized. I are, are utilized for. Um, uh, for the turbines or, or, the, or, or, or the, the engines in the ships, so there is no emissions on, on, on from this point of view, methane emissions from this point of view. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Jacques. Okay. Um, meanwhile, here a little sort of uh, debate uh, between participants uh, started, and uh, well, uh, the, the question is, um, or let's say that the topic debated is, uh, is an old one, to be honest. Is uh, is there a need for infrastructure? Are there bottlenecks that can be solved uh, thanks to um, uh, by adding more infrastructure? And if so, which infrastructure? Let's uh, pay attention to cost-benefit analysis because in some cases it, it can be um, trying to to make the best out of the current infrastructure that we have, or if we need new ones. Um, new infrastructure, uh, let's pay attention to the costs because uh, LNG, um, 
platforms LNG regasification terminal are expensive. So just to I, I sum up uh, this uh, this conversation, perhaps I would ask the neutral question mark view of Christopher on uh, on this. Is there a problem of infrastructure to solve? And if so, uh, how can LNG help in this sense? Is there a need for more LNG terminals? Uh, Christopher, I think your mic is muted. Yes, try now. Please. Yes. OK, that's good. I don't think we need more LNG terminals per se. We have 212 BCM import capacity um, of a demand of 570. So there's there's plenty of LNG terminals. The, um, from the Commission's perspective, um, they've made it very clear that um, an additional capacity is needed in uh, Crook in Croatia in order to bring LNG as competitive source into the region of Croatia, Hungary, and that sort of area. But um, I think the, the need for additional LNG terminals is limited. What is a great priority is to connect the, um, the existing LNG to um, consumption. And there we have some issues that do need to continue to be solved, such as the fact that all the capacity in Spain is more or less isolated. So it's a matter of connecting the terminals we have through limited investments um, rather than building new LNG terminals. OK, thank you very much. Um, I would refrain from asking your own uh, view to, on this question to, to the other speakers. Um, let's proceed with a few more. But thank you very much. Let me thank the participants, because this is also um, precisely uh, uh, one of the uh, missions of having such uh, online debates, is to stimulate discussion. So thank you very much for uh, um, taking the initiative to, uh, to bring this uh, discussion forward. Um, I would pick now another question as we are approaching the end of this uh, debate. Um, there is first a clarification question, I think, to you, Peter. Uh, what do you mean by the Asian LNG demand is driven by policy and not economics? What I mean, although I, I, I would say that's pri my reference was primarily to the Chinese market. Uh, in the case of China, uh, they have a lot of coal that they use in boilers in industry and even domestic. And so there's, uh, that has had a very uh, bad effect on the quality of urban air. And so the policy of the government is to eliminate those coal boilers primarily to, to by <coughs> installing instead new natural gas boilers. Now, the fuel is much more expensive than the coal it's replacing, and so uh, the uh, residents and the businesses that are now using gas are much cleaner, but they are also paying a lot more for energy than they used to. So that's what I mean by a policy thing rather than an economic thing. And generally speaking, when you have, when you're dealing with a country that has, a lot, has coal, for example, like China or India or Indonesia, for example, uh, gas is more as a more expensive fuel, so its penetration is quite dependent on, pol on okay. policy. Okay, great. Thank you for the clarification. And then uh, a question to um, all of you: How does the expert think about uh, SNG, uh, synthetic gas, um, using renewables, affecting the LNG market in Europe? Is it a threat, or is it to be perceived uh, in other way? So it's the. the SNG is the synthetic syn gas. It uh, stands for syn gas. For those who, of you who are not uh, familiar with it, um, who would like to answer first? Also, a very new topic. Huh? It's not that uh, there is much literature on uh, on this yet, uh, and the effects are still to be seen, of course. But well, I I, I would sure. it's Christopher. Um, it's, it's worth looking at the Commission's document from last week on its 2050 1.5 degree, where it does talk quite a lot about synthetic gas and hydrogen, because it's clear um, that if we are going to go to a very highly decarbonized energy system, then hydrogen or synthetic gas, certainly for industry, will need to play a role. Um, this being said, 
it's going to be an awful lot more expensive than natural gas, at least where we are today. So I don't expect that there will be any widespread um, substitution of natural gas or LNG or whatever it may be um, by synthetic gas in the, uh, with existing ETS prices. So you're probably looking at post-2030 something before that would yes. become a real issue. Sure. Thank you. Um, let's see if there are some remaining questions that I have neglected. Um, okay, there is one on Qatar, so on the role of Qatar in the, uh, let's say, geopolitics of LNG. So uh, since um, Qatar has not been a member of OPEC from 31st December 2018, uh, what's the input that uh, Qatar has? What's, how does it enter the picture? Maybe Peter again? Well, not, uh, not so much, because it's really a gas producer. Uh, I think it, it produces around 2 million barrels a day of, of, of liquids, but most of that is natural gas liquids rather than, than crude oil. Uh, so so it's, its impact on the oil, it, its impact is uh, fairly small overall. And of course, Qatar, as they've said, are, you know, their main focus is on further development of their natural gas fields and their natural gas resources. It's much more priority for that country than, than oil is. So I don't, I don't see a big impact on, either on the Qataris or on... on other views oil from oil the other oil panelists oil. on this? No? Okay. Um, then I think... Uh, there are, uh, uh, Chiara, I would like to uh, ask you to help me if I forgot any <laughs> any question. There, are, I see uh, many interventions, but they are more uh, joining the the previous debate on uh, on infrastructure. And I promise I will read all of them. And if that's the case, organizing a new debate uh, <laughs> on this topic. Um, okay. So maybe yes, David. Uh, David asks if uh, we can, if he can get a small comment about uh, small-scale LNG. Indeed, this is something that uh, uh, seems also to be gaining more and more importance in the in the picture. So, um, any views, perhaps uh, starting from Jacques? Uh, yes, uh, regarding small-scale LNG. Uh, um, yes, uh, we we are uh, quite uh, confident that uh, small-scale LNG will, will develop. Uh, it, uh, it has started already um, with the use of LNG for, for trucks. Uh, e even in your poll, it doesn't appear uh, as an important uh, topic. But uh, on the, the figures that uh, GLE has uh, shows a very, very rapid development of the, of the use of, uh, of LNG for trucks. But it's quite uh, it's it's quite easy because we were we started from almost zero. So, but uh, the number of trucks that has uh, that entered into operations uh, run by LNG uh, has increased. There are uh, new stations for LNG. Regarding uh, maritime transport, regarding shipping, uh, there is also a, a lot of signals, uh, very very strong signals that show that LNG will develop. Very rapidly, the most of uh, the, the most of these uh, signals are the numbers of uh, cruise ships, heavy, uh, not heavy, but very, very large cruise ships. Uh, there, were, there were the first cruise ship, uh, Ida, Ida Nova, will enter into operation this month, and uh, more than ten or twelve will will follow in the two or, or, or three three years from from now. And also there is. Uh, uh, the uh, container um, uh, container transport company uh, CMA CGM CMA CGM that has ordered uh, nine uh, big uh, container ships uh, that will be fully uh, motorized with uh, with LNG. So, so we have str strong signals. Uh, we have to develop uh, the infrastructure for um, um, for supplying the, the LNG. So it's not uh, ev everything is is not uh, yet done. We have still a lot of work to do, 
and uh, uh, the support from the European Commission uh, on this point is will be welcome. Um, but we are very confident on that point. Maybe if you allow me, if you have one minute, just one second, I just would like to mention the bio GNL. Uh, we, you mentioned thin gas, but there is also some a lot of not not, not a lot, but the, the research regarding uh, the production of bio, bio GNL uh, is something that has started. Uh, we heard a lot of uh, we, we had a lot of uh, about um, uh, green gas, uh, but there is also green LNG that uh, that will come. Great. Thank you very much. Let me uh, close this very interesting online debate by thanking each of you for uh, interesting uh, uh, remarks and for bringing your knowledge to, uh, to this platform. Uh, Peter, I know you have to leave, so I will start uh, saying goodbye to you, to uh, Jacques Rottenberg, Bernard Van Hol, and Christopher Jones. Thank you very much to our speakers and to our participants who came up with uh, very interesting questions to be further explored, I'm sure. Thank you all, and Thanks keep us. following us. Thank to you, Ilaya, for, for organizing you. this uh, session. Thank you. Thank you very much. We'll be in touch. Bye-bye to all. Bye.